Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, application security has evolved so much and so quickly over time. And for a lot of us, those challenges have meant we need to adapt and to scale. So we're all here to share some of the challenges we face scaling application security at our organizations and to connect with you all about what you're facing. Uh, we're so excited about this event and we're looking forward to sharing some of the challenges uh, that we're looking at. Um, uh, for a quick overview of the agenda before we get started with trivia, um, we'll go from trivia into our lightning talks. Um, we've got folks from GitHub, Twilio, and Netflix here to give 20-minute talks with five-minute Q&A um, about some of the ways that we're approaching application security. Uh, and then we'll go into the birds of a feather breakouts, which are, will be a lot more interactive, and we'll look for active participation from all of you. All right, so it's 3.15. And now we're going to hear from Phil Turnbull from GitHub, who's going to be talking about engineering fundamentals, how GitHub tracks security debt. And then as a reminder, if you have questions, please drop them in the Slido, and I will moderate those questions uh, after Phil gives his lightning talk. Thanks, Julia. Uh, so yeah, hi, I'm Phil from the product security engineering team here at GitHub. Um, today, we're going to talk about GitHub's uh, engineering fundamentals program. Um, and how we use that to track and remediate security tech debt. Um, so the fundamentals program is the main, main way that we track security debt uh, here at GitHub and how we scale remediation work across the whole company. Um, so this program has been running for a couple of years at this point, uh, tracking things like um, clear, durable ownership, uh, incident readiness, uh, performance, um, et cetera. In the last year though, uh, Multiple security teams have been partnering with the program to integrate security findings and track security debt alongside more traditional forms of tech debt. So a quick overview of the talk. Uh, so firstly, I'm going to frame the problem a bit more and give some more context about what it is we're actually trying to solve and how we're trying to do that at scale. Um, then we'll dive into some of the internal tools that we use that allow us to track various forms of tech tech here at GitHub. Um, once we have some background about the tools, I'll talk a lot more in depth about how, what this fundamental program is, how it works um, on a sort of monthly basis and how it works on a day-to-day -day basis and how it affects engineering teams. And finally, I'll talk about some lessons that we've learned over the past uh, year or so uh, using this to manage security tech debt. So the problem, um, there's many different forms of tech that we, that we want to track and remediate. Um, like I said, there's, there's kind of uh, more traditional tech debt, uh, such as performance, um, having uh, systems that are um, have incident readiness uh, set up. So for example, uh, for example sort of um, pages and so forth. Um, then there's also security tech debt that we want to want to track as well. Things like container scanning results, uh, static analysis alerts, um, outdated dependencies, um, secrets stored in source code. Um, so there's a couple of problems here. So how do we prioritize all these different forms of tech debt against one another? Um, what we're trying to avoid is having competing priorities that cause confusion across the company. For example, maybe one part of the company has decided that performance is our number one goal for this quarter. Then one part of security is really focused on uh, container scanning. And then yet um, another part of security is wants to burn down our backlog of static analysis alerts. Um, when we're working with sort of individual teams, this approach can work because um, we can afford to be a bit more hands-on with the teams and kind of clarify expectations. But as we scale this to the whole company, the lack of clear communications between different parts of the company just cause confusion. So the fundamentals program aims to bring all these stakeholders together and allow us to have a clear consensus on what the company's priority is right now. Um, then we can act on it and then move on to the next priority um, in a clear way that's obvious to engineers within the company. Um, as we have different stakeholders wanting to track different metrics uh, relating to tech debt, how do we avoid siloing various metrics in different systems? Um, instead, how do we easily track all forms of traditional and security tech debt at a company level that is visible to the whole company? Um, so that's the kind of problem statements. Um, and throughout this talk, I'm going to use a concrete example of 
outdated dependencies. This is something my team has been driving for the past year through the fundamentals program. And we've learned a few interesting things over the year. So how do we actually track this tech that, though? What kind of tools do we use? Um, so the number one thing we need is we need an accurate view of all things inside GitHub that we actually care about. At GitHub, we use the concept of services, and we have tools to track these services internally. Um, these represent systems that are deployed to production, and from a, from a security point of view, they represent risks to GitHub and our users. Um, this service concept allows us to reason about different things in a consistent way in a single place. Um, you'll notice I'm using the word thing because I'm being intentionally a bit vague. Uh, we use this to track uh, um, applications that deploy to bare metal uh, inside Kubernetes, in Azure, um, SaaS providers that we rely on, um, large database clusters, et cetera. Um, and also, obviously, we need to consider things that are uh, user facing. We also want to track employee only systems as well. So uh, services, as I just said, um, are our most kind of generic way of tracking things inside GitHub, and they are stored inside our service catalog. This is an internal tool built by our SRE team. It is the single source of truth for all things running in production at GitHub. It allows us to move away from a um, machine level or repository centric view of, of systems inside GitHub. So for example, github.com is powered by a, a large Rails application. Um, tracking that as an individual service doesn't scale. Instead, it's actually broken up into about 250 different logical services. Um, they're broken up from one repo into the service catalog, and then we can track the various forms of tech that independently across the different logical features. So for example, um, the GraphQL and REST APIs they're both implemented in the main monolith. Um, they're implemented in the same repo, but they're actually owned by different teams. So by breaking them out into different logical services, we have a much more accurate way of tracking tech debt. Um, it's not just a flat list of services though. We align services against the company org chart. Each service has an executive sponsor, typically at the VP level, who is ultimately responsible for the health of each service. This drives accountability across the company and avoids um, services with unclear ownership. Once services aren't clearly owned, burning down that tech debt, it becomes much more difficult. There we go. Okay, so how does this relate to our running example of outdated dependencies? So the service catalog allows us, attach to, allows us to attach scorecards to individual services so that we can score them on particular metrics. This is, a, this is a really lightweight process. Anyone at GitHub can take their data source and feed it into the service catalog and um, calculate metrics for each individual service. Um, so for outdated dependencies, um, we build on top of Dependabot, which is a native feature of GitHub. Um, so for, um, yeah, for, for Dependabot, we have um, built internal tooling. We pull the Dependabot data from GitHub using the standard GraphQL APIs that anyone can use. We then associate those with uh, logical services inside the service catalog and upload a summary. Um, and we do this continuously. So we have fresh data every couple of hours. Um, we also enrich this data. So we uh, simply by grouping by severity. And then we also assign a clear SLO to each, uh, each different severity. Um, the idea here is that at the, the company level, communicating expectations to service owners can be difficult. Instead, we, um, we enforce these SLOs in our tools, so there's no ambiguity about what our expectations are in terms of when engineering teams should be uh, remediating the pen bar alerts. So that was just one example of a scorecard that we're feeding into service catalog. Um, we would have multiple systems all feeding into uh, the catalog with their different scorecard data. And what this allows us to do is that we can 
we can centralize all these different metrics into one view under each individual service. This allows service owners at a, at a glance to get a quick overview of the health of all of the services that they maintain. And of course, we can then view the metrics over time to spot trends. There you go. Sorry, I was just having trouble moving the slides. Um, cool. So we have, um, that was just a very quick intro to our tools. So we have sort of service catalog, um, depend about data is flowing into it. So now we can see where we're using outdated dependencies and where the risk is. Uh, SLOs are applied um, and they're clear to service owners about what our expectations are. Um, we can now see where the problem areas are and we can also see how that aligns with the org charts. Um, so now what? How do you actually prioritize fixing these things across multiple teams and across multiple business units? How do you then scale this to the whole company? So that's where our engineering fundamentals program comes in. It's the, it's the business process that's built on top of service catalog that allows us to drive change across the company. Um, and it has full buy-in from GitHub leadership. It's managed by TPM, the technical project management group, uh, with a large cross-functional cross group of contributors. So we have reps from uh, individual engineering teams, many different security teams, uh, web systems, SRE. Um, so it's a real kind of cross-functional group. Um, it's kind of nicknamed the Fundamentals Champions, and they're responsible for driving the process on a, on a weekly and a monthly basis. Um, like I said, it has buy-in from uh, leadership, and this has been crucial for the success of the program. It ensures that there's alignment across, uh, across the company, across various competing priorities. And it's always, it's always clear to individual teams and business units what the current focus is, what a particular type of tech debt are we currently trying to burn down, which one is the highest priority for the company as a whole. So what does this actually look like in process, uh, in practice, sorry. Like I said, this is a business process built on top of our internal tooling. Um, so the, the program runs on a monthly cadence, which culminates in a uh, meeting with uh, service owners, the respective uh, VPs and the head of engineering. At GitHub, we run on openness and this program is no difference. All of the engineering org is invited to these monthly meetings. And it's a blameless opportunity to talk about which services need attention, talk about the progress we've been making on them, and talk about realistic paths forward. Um, it runs on a regular cadence with a standard format. So at the beginning of the month, the champions group is responsible for creating a list of the most um, of the services which we're most concerned about and sharing those out across the company. Again, this is all done out in the in the open. Uh, service, owner, service owners then spend the next two or three weeks um, incorporating this tech debt um, backlog into their sprint planning and then working on remediating these alongside uh, feature development work for the next two or three weeks. At the end of the month, we have our synchronous meeting with the engineering leadership VPs and the whole of the engineering org if they would like to attend. And that's where we review the progress made and discuss any blockers. Um, so sometimes there are blockers, um, sometimes other work gets prioritized above uh, this maintaining, uh, above maintenance and above burning down tech debt. Um, if this happens, um, you know, sometimes this might happen, you know, maybe there is, we need to support a customer with a, with a uh, specific issue, and maybe that will take precedence over various forms of tech debt. Um, so if that happens, we, we talk about it in the meeting and we talk about why that happens and we talk about what is a realistic, a realistic way forward. Um, sometimes that means that we might not see progress for the next month. Sometimes we won't see progress till the next quarter and that's okay. We just need a clear idea about what resources we have and how we can use them uh, to, to burn down particular pieces of tech debt. But a lot of the time, a lot of the time, this meeting is actually an opportunity to, to celebrate the progress that service owners have made over the past month. 
uh, which is really, really fun to see. So taking our um, dependency example again, um, so uh, I'm responsible for building out a list at the beginning of the month of uh, services that I have concerns about. So services with any high or critical uh, dependable alerts or services with a large number of dependable alerts that are currently outstanding. Um, we pass those on to service owners and then they are responsible for um, you know, upgrading dependencies or removing dependencies they no longer needed. And then we review that progress at the monthly meeting. Um, I mean, we do see blockers on some of that work. So as everyone knows, you know, maybe doing large upgrades just takes longer than a couple of weeks. So maybe upgrading Rails 5 to Rails 7, um, that, will, that may take longer than two weeks. Um, and that's fine. Like I said, it's a, it's a blameless venue for people to just talk about what progress they've made and what the path forward is. So this is a very high level view about uh, our journey over the past year for Dependabots, uh, for, for burning down this backlog of, of outdated dependencies. So we enabled Dependabot company-wide a long time ago. Repo owners were receiving Dependabot alerts directly. Um, so they were aware of which repos uh, had outdated, outdated dependencies. Um, but as a company, we lacked a clear overview about how we were doing. So were, were service owners investigating those alerts and, and actually updating dependencies? Um, which dependent alerts were affecting production systems and which ones were just affecting uh, hack week projects or kind of proof of concept projects that never made it into production? They don't pose a risk to GitHub or our customers. Um, so we, we want to be clear about what we're tracking and make sure we're actually tracking real risk that affects GitHub. Um, so at this point, we decided to leverage the existing engineering fundamentals program. Um, we integrated with Service Catalog to create the dependency scorecard in mid-2021. Um, and then at that point, we had a clear overview about how dependable alerts are impacting our production services and what the risk was. Um, at the beginning, we had about uh, two thirds of services with no dependable alerts past our defined SLO. Um, we tracked these metrics through the program for a couple of months and found that the, the trend was pretty flat. Um, and the, that flat trend can be a bit misleading. What it actually means is that new dependable alerts were being, were being actioned as they were being published, um, but we weren't burning down the, the backlog of, of dependable alerts that have been there for several months. So we now have solid data across the whole company that shows that our, the use of known vulnerable dependencies was a, was a real risk, and we could quantify that risk across the company. Um, in late 2021, uh, again, with buy-in from our engineering leadership, we made dependencies a focus for the final quarter of the year, and we drove that through the engineering fundamentals program. Um, obviously, we had this backlog of one third of services having dependable issues, but we set realistic goals for each month, and we used the fundamentals program to focus on a specific subset every month. Um, this, allowed to, this allowed us to break down the backlog across the company to make sure it was distributed evenly across different business units and then show incremental improvements over the months, which built up over the quarter. Um, and by the end of the year, we increased the number of services with no um, outstanding dependable alerts from 66% all the way up to 81%. And we did that in about, uh, did that in one quarter. So three, three iterations of the, of the fundamentals program. Um, right now, we found that progress on dependent bot alerts has, has mostly plateaued again. So actually this month we've announced a renewed focus on this with the aim of, build, of, of burning down that final 20%. Um, and because we're tracking this through the engineering fundamentals program, through service catalog, we have, these, uh, we, have, um, we have this high level data so we can, see the, we can see the trends over months and quarters and catch these kind of issues. So finally, on to lessons learned. Um, 
So firstly, we found that uh, focusing on dependencies renewed a lot of conversations around decommissioning services. We had many services um, that were in various states of decommission. And by making this security risk um, visible and quantifiable, we were able to drive that decommission process faster. Uh, service owners would rather decommission a service now than spend time uh, updating dependencies only to decommission the service in the future. Um, secondly, things take time at the company scale with several hundred services, you really need to think in terms of quarters and multiple quarters. It's no longer, you're no longer able to kind of plan in the weeks and months timeframes. Um, what didn't go well? Um, we didn't have, and we didn't communicate what success looks like for this dependency project. Um, is success having every service at GitHub um, um, having no dependable alerts? I mean, that is success, but there will always be a long tail of services that don't quite meet that requirement. Um, so now we have a clearer view and we, we target sort of 90, having 90% 90 of services with no dependable alerts as being, as being a success. Um, and then we can move on to other areas of tech debt while we just slowly burn down that remaining 10%. Um, and then finally, as I just hinted at, um, you need to continuously monitor trends to ensure that progress is not plateaued. Um, this happened with our dependency work. We made good progress in, or great progress in, in one quarter, but then it, it, it plateaued off in the, at the beginning of the new year. Um, this led to progress stalling and really um, removed a lot of momentum from the progress we were making. Um, so like I said, right now we're having a renewed focus on dependencies and then we're hoping in the current quarter to get ourselves up to 90%, which we consider a success. And that is all for me. And we can go into the Q&A with Julia. Awesome. Thank you so much, Phil. That was great. Um, we have a ton of questions. So I'm going to start from the top. So this is from Patrick Thomas. Um, he says, uh, related to mapping large projects to services and service catalog, how do you manage those mappings so you're showing things at the right level of abstraction? Um, so in terms of abstraction, yeah, so uh, a lot of our services um, do actually map, map back to individual repos. Obviously, as you might imagine, being at GitHub, we kind of view a repository as our kind of base level of work. Um, so I would say that 90% of services are probably repo centric and there's only a handful of services where we really have to, you know, break down one repository into several services. All right. Thank you. Um, Aaron asks, is all the data for the service catalog all coming from GitHub or other services? Um, so the service catalog API is fairly generic. So obviously dependency data comes from Dependabot. Uh, we do integrate um, a couple of open source tools as well for the, so we track container scanning results, uh, which is built off a couple of open source container scanning tools. Um, I think this one was asked by a couple of different people, but any chance service catalog could be made open source? I don't believe in there's any plans <laughs> in open sourcing yet, and that is a very frequent question. All right, yeah, uh, TBD. Um, cool, so do your org charts shift around over time? Is that a manual process to update into the service catalog? How is it enforced that every service has a sponsor? This question is from Arjun. Ah, uh, yes, that's interesting. So um, this gets a bit meta, one of the, one of the metrics we track against each service is, does it actually have um, accurate ownership? So yeah, so org changes um, does cause some does cause uh, some churn there. Um, so we our org chart org chart data comes from our HR system, and that's imported automatically, and then. Then there is an individual scorecard that makes sure that the executive sponsor is actually still at the VP level. Um, unfortunately, then it's actually a manual process to fix up some of that ownership data. 
Um, so there's still improvements to be made there. Awesome. Yeah, I think ownership is kind of a frequent problem for us as well. Um, so when you solve that, please, please let me know. I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Alexis asks, what is the driving force behind the org wide buy in for engineering fundamentals? Um, so we need we need org wide buy in. So, so the issue we're trying to avoid is different parts of the company having um, having different priorities and then communicating those out. Um, if we have, you know, if we have sort of the security org, you know, saying dependencies is now our focus right now, and then you know another part of the org saying on oh, our no, performance is a real issue. You know, we've heard from customers that performance is an issue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and maybe there's other parts of the company that has their own priorities. This just causes um, conflicting messaging. And we find that we don't really make progress because teams are, they're not able to focus on burning down one piece of tech debt at a time. Instead, they're, they're spreading themselves too thin and we're not really making progress on any one form of tech debt. So the idea of having an org buy-in from kind of engineering leadership and up to the CEO is that we can actually clearly set what our priorities are at a company level and we avoid these kind of conflicting priorities. Awesome. Well, I think we're unfortunately at time. There's a few more questions in here that we won't get to. So I apologize uh, to the folks whose questions we didn't get to ask. Um, but thank you so much, Phil. Appreciate your time and, and your talk. Uh, we are going to go next to Ariel and Vlad from Twilio. We're going to talk about democratizing vulnerability management. Take it away. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentation on making risk everyone's responsibility. I'm Ariel, and I'm presenting with my colleague, Vlad. A little about me, I'm a product security engineer at Twilio and I'm based out of San Francisco. My fun fact is that I have a 175 day streak on Duolingo, Gem Duolingo. Thanks Ariel. And my name is Vlad. I'm an engineer and manager here for one of our product security teams and I'm based in Denver. My fun fact, unfortunately, cannot one up Ariel's but I do own the highest score in our security training for Python. And wanted to just drop in and leave a quick line about the culture of Twilio. We've worked very hard to make sure security is on top of mind for everybody. We're focusing on great, building great relationships and streamlining our process to get security working as well as we could for our stakeholders. And some of the things that we're doing for that is <clears throat> we are including a project that we're kicking off for self-serve threat modeling to get security out of the way and let engineers deploy at their speed. We are also going to be talking about today, which is man vulnerability management and making risk everybody's responsibility. And let's dive in. Uh, one second. So let's talk about vulnerability management for a moment here. And first, why is that important? So vulnerability management is the process of addressing gaps in security that lead you exposed to threats. That exposure is your risk. It's important to have a strong vulnerability management program to reduce your threat and vulnerabilities, which will in turn reduce your risk. Oftentimes, when we begin uh, a vulnerability management program, we have something like this. Let's think about it in terms of a ticket. This is the normal workflow you can expect, and this could come around for basically any ticket that you may have in your system. Let's talk about it. So first, a vulnerability is identified by a security engineer who then goes on to open a ticket with some context for the developer that picks it up to be able to action on it. At times, the developer may need additional time to be able to complete the work, in which case they may request SLA extension. At times, the developer may not be able to fix it, may not want to, or it just may not be possible, in which case the risk may possibly get accepted. In the other case, everything can go perfectly right, the vulnerability is resolved, and the ticket will be closed. Uh, but then we hit a little bit of a snag. Our company grew very, very rapidly. We went from a company of about 1,000 people to over 8,500 today in just a span of three to four years. 
Now, the effects this had are plenty. Think about organization structures changing, new teams joining, companies basically being acquired and new products coming into the fold. This includes a lot of rapid changes. And we can take a look at how this affects us at each of our stakeholders. So let's meet our stakeholders. We have our developers who are the ones that will be actioning and resolving our security vulnerabilities. We have our security engineers who will be the ones identifying these vulnerabilities. And lastly, we have our leaders. This could be engineering managers, VPs, and directors, and they're the ones that are responsible to help us drive down security debt. They will also help us in, by showing and setting focus on where we need to spend time and additional security. So let's take a look at it from a security engineer's point of view. An engine, a security engineer may be stuck chasing down engineers to find. They may be constantly following up with engineers to ensure that they're fixing vulnerabilities in a timely manner. Sometimes those tickets may breach SLA before it even has an owner. The security engineer may become overloaded with tickets and keeping track of them, in which case they may break it out into spreadsheets to help keep track a bit better. If this slide looks terrible, that's on purpose. This is meant to showcase the mess that could be happening. In many instances, we can have security engineers taking certain slices of open vulnerabilities for displaying certain metrics. Now these vulnerabilities could exist, be talked about literally everywhere. It could be in JIRA, it could be in Workday, it could be in Slack, wikis, everywhere. We've even included a picture of a person not being there as to be honest, sometimes people do leave. Continuing on, uh, we're gonna use Ariel as our example as uh, she has clearly been chasing people down. Um, so let's take a look at some of the messages that we see. She has had a need to create a spreadsheet of all tickets that have breached SLA to make that easier to show leadership, which obviously is not ideal. A customer asking for percent of breached SLAs. Anyone know that number off the top of your head? I usually prefer to go by real data than trying to guess as best we can. Hey team, who knows anybody who owns a specific feature? This person has left months ago and now nobody is working on any of that. And continuing on, as you can see, the theme is pretty common. Eventually to going down to the last message there, which is, let's call it nicely, really asking for somebody to fix a vulnerability. Next, let's see what this looks like to a developer. As the company grew very quickly, we may have introduced new specialized security teams. Those teams may have introduced their own ticket types, which leads to confusing ticket workflows for the developer. Inconsistent SLAs, they may have two critical tickets one may be due in a week where the other has plenty more time. And even in the event where we see where they are doing their best to actually remediate the vulnerability, the complex process to get through the ticket may discourage people and not let them put in the effort they may otherwise have. Let's take a look at what could possibly happen. Speaking of multiple teams, we have Team Rockstar, Team Monster, and Team Red Bull. We also have Team Gatorade. We'll get to that in a moment. But as you can clearly see, Team Rockstar and Team Monster have basically the same exact ticket flow, except they have their own different ticket types, which means they could have different SLAs, which means they can have different acceptance criteria, and so on. This could be really challenging as a developer to have to remember which ticket came from where and who to contact. Continuing on, we notice that there are, one moment, Just continuing on, we notice that there is a team Gatorade involved. What this means is throughout some of the processes regarding on how the work is going, this ticket may end up with another team, entirely different team. They may have an entirely different process to continue. Lastly, we could see the team Red Bull, although it's pretty closely related in the workflow to the other tickets, has entirely their own entire ticket types. And workflows associated with it. So what does this all roll up to? Our leaders and people who need to respond to customer requests may not have the proper data to be able to show the correct picture. We may have inconsistent metrics based on how these ticket types are working. How do we compare tickets that may be in different states that don't exist across other tickets? It becomes very difficult to hold people accountable when our variances are so big and Let's be honest, those tickets may not even have owners. Continuing on, 
it may be very difficult for our leaders to be able to push their peers and other leaders to tackle these security issues and take them seriously when we cannot paint an accurate picture of where we are today. Keeping all this in mind, let's head over to with Ariel and discuss how we can fix this. Our solution is to democratize vulnerability management. This means prioritizing the democratic principles of accessibility and accountability for all three of our stakeholders, our engineers, us, the security engineers, and our leaders. We're going to dive in with high priority requirements that are crucial in democratizing your vulnerability management process. Let's start with the workflow. First, the workflow includes checks to hold individuals accountable. When we take a look back at the first iteration of our workflow, this workflow requires us to push for accountability within one of these steps, usually the in-progress stage, after we assigned a ticket or notice that the SLA is breaching soon. It's a lot of manual work to tag individuals in comments or reach out via Slack to get people to work on a ticket to figure out what to do. You also have to wait on their response and sometimes you keep asking again. This new workflow explicitly includes steps that add accountability. After a ticket is created, the ticket is moved to need security owner triage. In this step, the security team is responsible for triaging the ticket and adding context. Then they pass it off to the risk owner. The risk owner is the person responsible for pushing to get this vulnerability fixed within the proposed timeline. This is usually the engineering manager or the product manager. Instead of waiting till a ticket has almost reached LA or already reached SLA, we introduce the step when the risk owner first sets their eyes on this ticket. With this workflow, the security engineer is no longer pushing to get a ticket fixed within SLA. The responsibility now lies in the hands of the risk owner. If the risk owner can fix it in the proposed timeline, they'll move it to triage. And they start fixing uh, this vulnerability within SLA. However, if the risk owner is unable to fix the vulnerability within the proposed timeframe, they would propose an extension. Who approves an extension is important as their decision carries risk. We continue to make risk everyone's problem by making sure we're asking the correct people to accept risk. Depending on the severity level, the extension approver changes. If it's a P1 or critical, the general manager or GM is responsible for extending risk and extending the SLA. If it's a P2 or high, this goes to the VP, P3's director or business unit lead. P4 or P5s are lows and informationals, and the risk owner will automatically get approved for a risk extension. There's still oversight by the security team as we're tracking the number of extensions within a ticket. We may reject extensions as they pose an ethical, legal, or other risk. The extension approver may differ based on your reporting structure and your organization, but you still want a hierarchy of individuals to reach out to push for accountability. What's really important to note is that risk is everyone's problem. The security team does not own the risk for vulnerability not being fixed within SLA. There's a risk owner assigned and responsible for the vulnerability who shares the risk with their extension improver, who can range from the GM to the business unit lead. This shared responsibility is reflected not only in the workflow steps, but it's also reflected in the due date extensions. When you remove the friction and you make it clear to individuals what their responsibilities are, you start to see more action and more accountability, and this actually works. So let's talk about a real life example of this workflow at Segment. Since it's a real example, a lot of the information is heavily redacted, but bear with me on this slide as I try to show you a normal way our leaders, developers, and security engineers communicate in JIRA about a due date extension. A developer was assigned a P2 vulnerability and needed more time, so they proposed a due date extension. Since it's a P2, the extension approval went to a VP. And the people care when their names are attached to the risk. The VP is accountable for this vulnerability, so they're not just going to accept the risk on this due date extension without seeing a complete plan for fixing this. The conversation alone urges the developer to fix this ticket as the leaders that they report to have visibility on this. It can't just fall through the cracks on accident or become deprioritized. The developer responds, yes, I'm confident we can solve it before November 5th. They actually fixed it early. Instead of taking an additional month, they fix the vulnerability seven days after this conversation. Our security engineer has visibility into this conversation, but they're not the ones responsible for this vulnerability or the risk that this vulnerability carries. They come in when they're actually needed to confirm that the vulnerability was fixed, and then they move it to remediated. This new workflow identifies clear owners at each stage and inherently pushes for accountability. 
The next requirement is that the workflow is applicable to all vulnerabilities within an organization. Vlad showed you this complicated workflow in which multiple security teams use similar but different workflows to handle their vulnerabilities. This workflow makes the developer confused and force them to figure out multiple processes. Democratized vulnerability management hinges on the process being accessible, so all the vulnerabilities need to follow the same workflow. The next point is similar, but an extraordinary exception is required to deviate from the workflow. This forces us to consider the developer and the leader's perspective. We don't want to create more processes for our teams to follow and track. However, at times the business needs change, so it would have to be an extraordinary exception. Last, risk is never accepted permanently. Going back to the first iteration Vlad discussed, when risk is permanently accepted, it's equivalent to closing out the ticket. You or a developer got someone to sign off on a vulnerability, and now it's out of sight, out of mind. We remove the permanent risk exception from this workflow, and there are two scenarios that generally come to mind. First, a team tells you that they're sensing the project in two months, so they need a permanent risk exception. In this scenario, you'd extend the due date to two months and confirm that the project has been closed and the risk that the vulnerability carries no longer exists. When two months pass and the project is still active, you would be able to reevaluate the risk and the project status. The second scenario are low priority issues such as P5s that the company accepts the risk on and is, would take more engineering hours than the value of the fix itself. For instance, Segment accepts the risk and GraphQL introspection enabled because we have mitigating controls. With this workflow, we reevaluate the risk and confirm that accepting the risk on this issue is still in line for our business objectives every year. We don't permanently accept risk because the business changes and each stakeholder, developer, security engineers, and leaders need to not only understand the risk that they carry, but reevaluate it as the business changes and grows. Metrics are the driving force to push risk to become everyone's problem. While individuals have visibility on individual tickets, developers, leaders, and security teams need to take a step back to understand what's going well and what needs improvement. Metrics are actionable. Numbers don't mean anything unless you add context. Whatever data you're collecting to indicate performance of a team or vulnerability needs to be tied with action, and this may look different dependent on the stakeholder. All organizations and teams should be present in one dashboard. Whether this is in Jira or a separate platform, all organizations and teams need to be on the same page. This is important to promote accessibility for all of our stakeholders. A singular, easy to access dashboard creates less friction and makes next steps clear. Metrics are attributable to individual teams. We want to be specific about which teams need to take more actions, whether this is through a dashboard or regular communications. Segment actually sends out emails to share actionable metrics with highlights week to week. We call it specific teams that are successful and teams that need to prioritize security. Last, vulnerabilities should be tied to top risk tiers. We have this within our JIRA ticket where every vulnerability is tied to a top risk tier. So forget OWASP top 10, you'll have your company's top 10. And the bonus benefit is that you can use the company's top 10 risks to guide your annual security trainings. There are a few of the common responses we see in our weekly executive summary and highlight emails from the segment CEO and VP in 2021. Our metrics provide a lot of meaning for our leaders and engineering teams. People read these emails with actionable metrics and it makes a difference to our product. We made vulnerabilities visible and tied them back to responsible parties. It's easy for our leaders to push for accountability and start a discussion to make sure that security is top of mind for everyone. Our leaders are enthusiastic and encourage this democratic security culture. Now let's take it back to you, the security engineer. Democratized vulnerability management solves your pain points. You no longer have to chase engineers. You no longer have to keep developers, EMs, and leadership accountable. You don't have to worry about SLA breaches. Democratizing your vulnerability management process not only benefits you, but your organization massively benefits. It decreases risk. The more vulnerabilities you fix within SLA, the less risk your organization has. We also reduce the cost in terms of engineering hours. It's expensive to have security engineers and developers spending time to work on complicated processes and manually push to get tickets fixed. By holding individuals accountable through your improved workflow and metrics, you save engineering hours, which now frees up your time to work on meaningful projects. 
which then increases your security maturity. You decrease your operational work on your vulnerability management program and increase security projects that are strategic to increase your security maturity. You also maintain compliance by meeting SLA and accurately representing your vulnerability management process. This also helps with maintaining customer trust. When new questions arise from customers, you have clear visibility and a strong program to refer back to. To sum it up, a democratic vulnerability management program is one in which all stakeholders are included. Their voice matters, which means identifying pain points for your developers, engineering managers, leaders, and yourself, and solving these pain points with clear requirements and priorities. By including your stakeholders in the process, you ensure that every vulnerability is acted upon with the right person. Next, you should capture metrics to identify and fix chronically weak areas in your security posture. Metrics are the driving force to ensure individuals stay accountable, and you should be aware of where your program is succeeding and where your program needs more attention. Last, everyone's risk training will be different. You can never go wrong with increasing accountability and accessibility, but this may look different as your organization, depending on your resources and business needs. Thanks, everyone. I think we're ready for some questions. Thank you so much, Ariel and Vlad. We have actually a ton of questions. We'll see how many we can get through. Uh, our first one is, what types of vulns can one expect in this program? Bug bounty vulns? What about vulns discovered in threat modeling? Uh, something that hasn't been realized yet. So, um, yeah. So I've actually been diving deep onto the different types of vulnerabilities that will help. So we do have bug bounty vulnerabilities. And for things that are identified in the design review, we create a second issue type for a developer to create with us. We'll have that design review and then we'll actually create vulnerability tickets for them. And so because we have those due dates, we'll be able to reevaluate things. And so if something's a low risk and they say, it's probably not gonna be an issue in two months, we can reevaluate that in two months. So we'll house both those types of vulnerabilities. We'll have a separate design review ticket for threat models. Awesome, thanks Ariel. Hannah C asks, how do you determine the severity level? Do devs slash risk owner ever disagree on the severity level? Yes, yeah. they do disagree. Thought if you want to take this one. Yes, uh, they absolutely do disagree. Uh, the risk, the risk level for us is the threat and you know the exposure that comes along with it. Uh, obviously, the severity of the vulnerability itself there. Uh, and oftentimes we do get disagreement. It's something that, you know, we, we obviously have to paint a good picture or tell a good story to explain exactly the cause of the vulnerability and why it meets the specific severity we've assigned it. At times, uh, obviously, if there are compensating controls, we have talked down vulnerability severity levels to reflect that as well. Thank you. Um, all right. How challenging is or was it to get leaders, owners, VPs, executives into the JIRA workflow as opposed to emails or spreadsheets? So we implemented this program at Segment and this quarter I'm now implementing that for Twilio and the size is vastly different. But what we did was we did interviews with developers, engineering managers, and security leadership. We we're able to get buy-in by showing the pain points and just having the evidence, this overwhelming amount of evidence that this program is needed. And it was specific to our organization. And I think when you try to get that buy-in early and you're taking people's perspectives, you'll get that buy-in. Awesome. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, yeah, do exec executives love logging into JIRA now? You've convinced them? Yeah, a few of them do. We'll see comments and it's, I think you saw like the redacted, like their comments are in JIRA and I think it's great to see that interaction because you don't always expect it. But when you do see leaders in JIRA, like they've got their eyes on it. People are making security a priority and that's a big part of the culture at Twilio. Awesome. Uh, Peter R asks, what happens when teams continuously push back the SLA and never fix the vulnerabilities? You've got leaders keeping them accountable. So a team can't just push back and pretend like it didn't happen or say, ooh, it slipped through. You have leaders keeping them accountable and there's someone else that they're reporting to. So that can't happen with a system of accountability. Awesome. Um, Brenna asks, how do you designate a vulnerability ticket? Do you use a specific Ticket type, labels, workflow, or some combination. Yeah. So, thought of uh, Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so it, it's a combination of all. We do use a specific vulnerability ticket type, uh, but uh, it, it really is a combination of all. We 
use labels uh, is helping us kind of find the sources of the vulnerabilities. And also the labels are super useful when we want to do queries in JIRA and be able to locate a specific set of tickets. Thank you. Um, all right, Arjun asks, whose job is it to go about finding the initial risk owner? Do you ever run into unowned, unowned features or services? So another, uh, we had a question for the last one about ownership and a question here about ownership. I know we have those at Netflix. This seems to be a problem. What do y'all do about it? So you try to go to a higher level when you can't find an owner and ownership's a problem for everyone, but yeah. So this is up to the security engineer when they're initially triaging that person and it's in that security owner triage state. But once we identify an owner, let's say it's the wrong owner, it moves over to risk owner triage. And usually that person has a little bit more information and can, can course correct and identify a better risk owner. All right. This will probably be our last question. Um, are your SLA extension requests attached to any sort of security exception process or compliance process? But you're not going to take that. Uh, I believe, yeah, you got it. Uh, yes. So it, it, it is a, attached to an exception process. Uh, we do take account, uh, especially when we're finding the, I guess, the, the owner of that of vulnerability, we, we do take into account the various compliance requirements and stuff like that. As Ariel has also mentioned, uh, there may be legal consequences for not fixing a specific vulnerability and something along those lines as well. Awesome. Thank you both so much. Loved this talk. We have a lot more questions for folks who didn't get their questions answered. Join uh, the different breakouts. We'll have a chance to chat with each other in those and, and bring up some of those things. Um, all right, our final lightning talk is going to be Dan and Dave from Netflix talking about how we scale application security here. Hi, welcome to Asset Inventory in Prism, a graph-based approach to application security. My name is Dan Kolbrenner. I work as a senior security software engineer on the application security team at Netflix. I spent the last few years building distributed systems in the cloud, and now I help engineering teams improve the security of their software. Great, and I'm Dave King. I'm a, also a, an engineer on the application security engineering team at Netflix. Uh, I've been at Netflix for about six years, helping uh, to improve security there through automation and other things. And previously, I, like, I've spent about 20 years working for various companies like VMware and, and, and banking kind of doing similar things, pen testing, and also working with automation to make, you know, security better. Okay, so I'll start by stating the obvious. While there are vastly more product engineers than application security engineers, and while the ratio varies from company to company, Netflix is no exception to this rule, there are too many applications to take a white glove approach to security assessments for every one. So our first approach to solving this scale problem has to do with the makeup of the AppSec organization. It's split currently into two squads, the partnership team, which aims to reduce risk in our engineering ecosystem through strategic security initiatives in high risk, high leverage areas. Partners partner with specific orgs to assess and improve the security posture of their applications. While on the other side, the engineering team, the team that David and I are part of, we build services that provide contextually aware risk prioritized security recommendations for every application developer at Netflix. Our team enables self-service by providing developers and engineering leaders with information required to act in the best interest of the applications they own. As our team has evolved, we're also building out a third squad focused on security reviews and assessments. So all of this ties into how we do our engineering first approach at Netflix. So owners of a service typically own all aspects of that service, design, development, testing, operations, security. This is different from some organizations where a central security team owns the security of every application. We lean into Netflix's cultural value of context and not control. This means that we rarely, if ever, block teams based on a perceived security risk. Rather, it's our job to provide stakeholders the context about risks associated with their applications and the steps they can take to reduce those risks. We believe that it's unreasonable to expect every developer to be a security expert. 
Instead, we rely on security features that are on by default and security services that remediate entire classes of issues. And in cases where manual corrective action is required, we provide simple and contextually aware guidance about how to do so. So we kind of filter down this scale problem into how do we deliver contextually aware security guidance to every engineer at Netflix? So take the common application. It has some compute infrastructure. It is deployed maybe on EC2. We run predominantly in AWS or on some container running in the cloud. It might connect to a data store and has a bunch of tangential infrastructural services running, whether it's load balancers, they have DNS, TLS, all of this in a some AWS account somewhere and uh, within a, with networking infrastructure that's totally abstracted away from the developers. And this is just one application. At Netflix, we have thousands of microservices already deployed with new ones that get spun up daily. Hundreds of different AWS accounts with only a few security engineers to make sense of all of them. This creates a strong need for good automation to accurately deliver this security guidance. Props to Dave Hahn, a colleague, for his great talk at AWS reInvent, where he talked about the scale and managing this complexity at Netflix. So this kind of distills the problem into how do we keep track of all of these assets? that are constantly shifting and changing? How do we keep track of the relationships between these assets in this amorphous technological landscape? And finally, once we have that data, how do we make it all useful to actually deliver guidance to developers so that they can build their apps more securely? So you can't secure what you can't observe. And this observability problem is the first one that we're going to try to solve with the first tool that we're going to talk about in this talk. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague. Great. Thank you, Dan. So uh, so we have some experience kind of uh, trying to understand all these different parts. You know, we, we've built things in Netflix before and, you know, built things in other companies. So we, we decided to start with the data model. So we decided, OK, what exactly are we trying to understand? And what data are we trying to gather? Uh, like Dan showed, we, we kind of understood a typical app. So, you know, you have the app and its database and and DNS names also has presumably an owner, as we, we've talked about, that's sometimes kind of difficult. Uh, it has, uh, and, but then also, you know, those people also have other things about them, right? They have like their laptops and other things that they use. And there might be some interesting uh, correlate, like in correlations you can draw from that to see people who have insecure laptops and also, right, insecure applications. So we, we looked at uh, the ways that we could take this data, kind of put it all together and, and kind of understand the relationships between all of these different pieces uh, of this data at Netflix. And so, you know, starting with the data model, we looked at looked at various uh, different things and we landed on uh, this product uh, called PostGraphile. So uh, at Netflix, our, our uh, deployment of this is called um, Asset Inventory uh, Query Interface. So uh, this is an open source product. You basically like set up a, a Postgres database with relationships between different things connect this to it, it introspects and builds out a GraphQL endpoint. If you're not familiar with GraphQL, uh, it's basically like an API that allows you to, uh, to decide uh, to, to specify what you want back exactly. So instead of getting like a default set of things back, you, you specify which things. Uh, you can walk through these relationships really easily, like to whatever level you want. Um, and uh, and, it, it, and it's been a great, uh, a thing for us to do to be able to understand this. Uh, it has good community support and, and like some great plugins that people have developed and also has paid support that we use to kind of like if we have some harder issues that we're trying to solve and work through, uh, we, we have that as well. As, you, as you'll notice, we, we did not choose uh, Jupyter One, which I know uh, many people uh, use. We, we did look at it and, and we might find a place for it in Netflix, but with some of the requirements that we had uh, with like really fast uh, queries and also um, the, the, the fact that, that our environment is very different than a typical AWS environment. Uh, and then we, we have to deal with a lot of abstractions and can't like directly connect to AWS uh, uh, APIs and things like that. Then we had, then it, we were gonna have to build any, everything anyway. So we ended up kind of like buying a product and then building this on top of it. I guess kind of like using open source product, buying the support and building on top of it, I should say. 
So, uh, so here is just a really high level design. So on the left, you'll see a bunch of our like primary data sources. Spinnaker, which is our CI/CD uh, tool that we use at Netflix. Etta, which is an abstraction, which is a cache of API, uh, of AWS API. Jira, so we can pull in things like tickets that, that different uh, applications have and, and, and several other data sources. And those all get copied into Hive, so our big data portal. Uh, we do it in, in, in Hive uh, be, so we can keep historical uh, snapshots, like daily snapshots. And then we also copy the most recent data then into Postgres, which then backs this uh, asset inventory query interface, which I just talked about. And then around that, then we can build a whole bunch of other additional things that make it so this whole thing works, works really well. So we pull in metadata from a variety of sources. Cloud provider APIs or the caches of them, Jira, deployment infrastructure such as Spinnaker, Jenkins, Bitbucket. We have this great database to store the graph of ent entities and to represent the current state of our ecosystem plus an easy to use GraphQL API to query the collected information. So the next step is to write custom detections that turn that data into actionable security guidance. For this, we use a second tool called Prism. Prism is our internal modular scanner that loops over every single application in our ecosystem, or at least the ones that Asset Inventory knows about, to either identify a risk or to measure the adoption of a security control. So one of the things that makes this different than a lot of other scanning products is what it's looking for. This framework is, yes, it's used to understand the exposure of a vulnerability across our ecosystem, but it also looks for aspects of an application that introduce risk. Is this application internet facing? Does it store PII? Is it deployed onto a AMI or a Docker container that hasn't been updated in a year. So as it measures this risk, it is also measuring the adoption of the tools that are meant to remediate those. I'll bid on more on that later, but first specifically what is Prism? So it's a Python library for abstracting common AppSec operations, port scanning, checking for various vulnerabilities, building large lists of targets to feed into our scanner. It's a CLI for automating checks against a different application and working with these different plugins that security engineers write and build. We use a performant job processor called Factory to handle the queuing and the distribution of these workloads across hundreds of auto-scaling groups of workers. These workers are running constantly, daily scanning our infrastructure for risk and measuring the adoption of this paved road tooling. So generally speaking, the architecture looks like this. The Prism, Prism runs and it calculates the list of applications to scan. This could be a subset of our application fleet based on the requirements of a security control, or it could be like an incident response scenario where we just want to scan all the things and see where we're vulnerable. It puts it generates just a large list. It's basically just a large list of JSON and it puts it onto this queue, which then distributes it amongst the Prism workers. All of this is deployed into a VPC with an elastic network interface attached to it that allows us to route packets and send requests to every single compute uh, DNS record and load balancer within our environment. So what does this actually look like in code? Prism tasks are effectively just Python scripts and relatively small and simple ones at that. They're a class which has a run method which puts all the scanning targets in, onto a queue. We provide a Python library that allows you to easily just get every single app in our infrastructure and it returns IP addresses and host names for every app. Similarly, there's a worker run method, which are executed in parallel as different processes spread across auto scaling groups, operating on a single target at a time, performing a scan, and then writing the results of that back to asset inventory. One of the benefits of this approach is that all the security business logic is defined as code and can then be iterated on as new information comes to light. So, now that we know what developers are building, 
how do we influence them to build their app securely? What we mentioned earlier is that not only is Prism measuring the application risk, but it also measures the adoption of various platform provided tooling. If we're doing a security review of an app, you have to look at all of this. Uh, you have to talk about to developers about how they manage secrets and what operating system they're deploying their app onto. And we really don't want to take up that much of our time to ask all of these repetitive questions. And we certainly don't want to take up so much of our developers' time trying to solve for every single one of these problems. After all, they're not expected to be security experts. Instead, we want to rely on a platform provided abstraction so that developers only need to be concerned about the business logic of their application. All the stuff in green is addressed well by the products that our platform teams put out. Issues like immutable infrastructure, CICD, a base AMI, AWS account infrastructure, logging and secrets, all of these are addressed by our paved road that we as the AppSec team want to encourage developers, developers to adopt. So Prism scans each app for the presence of this tooling, and it nudges developers to adopt them when they're found to be missing. This way, we can measure the security posture of an application, not by the number of vulnerabilities found, but by how closely they adhere to the paved road. Great. And so now that we have, uh, you know, we have this great data in place, we have this way to query it. You know, we have this, uh, this tooling that lets us scan like at scale, like our entire uh, infrastructure like very quickly. Uh, and so now we have this great data. So now like, uh, how do we use it, right? And so here's, we're gonna talk about a few use cases. So the first one is exploration. It's, you know, kind of ad hoc queries. And so, you know, once once I have the data, I can write some pretty complex queries. So I can, uh, you know, I can filter on various things. Like, so here, you know, I start with an application. I wanna know what applications talk to that application and then what applications talk to those applications. And then I want to receive uh, or like get, some information about those, like what code repo that application has and, and what I, IAM roles they have and, and various things like that. And so I can easily do that. Um, at, in a previous life, so I was a security partner and, uh, and uh, so it was always really hard to get this data and it would slow me down often to, to have to like write a bunch of scripts to try to like pull this data together. Since we've made this, I've talked to some of this uh, security partners on the team and they said, They've been sitting in meetings and somebody asks a question about uh, their applications, you know, with their like the directors or, or something of a of a of a large group at, at Netflix, and they'll ask some question about the security of their applications, and the the uh, partner can just go and quickly during that meeting run a query and, and get that answer back sometimes, and so like that's that's super powerful and that really helps us uh, answer these questions. It gives us opportunities to answer the questions that we didn't even know we had, right? So you start exploring, you start realizing that there's things that uh, that you'd like to know. Uh, additionally, we even have uh, one of the, our security partners, he'll kind of explore and then he'll like kind of send out quizzes and say, you know, how many applications that Netflix fit into this category that's either secure or insecure and people guess. And then, it, you know, it's kind of a fun thing. We learn about our environment through this data and it's, and it's super powerful. Um, Another thing that we use it for, so that so our partners they do kind of white glove uh, work with our with our most risky parts of Netflix. But then there's all the rest of Netflix, right? There's you know all these these engineers that don't uh, like have that kind of one on one support. And there's no way, frankly, that we could do that, like Dan talked about earlier. And so we really lean into self service for that. And so to do that, you know, we have the asset inventory data. We have uh, built on top of that a risk model that uses. You know all this data we know about the controls that are in place and about the you know the data that's there and uh, and you know the, the type of technology it's built on and its accessibility all of this and then on top of that we built a UI that's uh, that we call security guide and so basically then teams can come uh, look at their app and they can say uh, you know how how is my app doing like what are the security controls that that I'm doing well at and what are the ones that I really need to fix? Like what are the vulnerabilities out there that I need to fix? And so teams can do that. Uh, we also understand though that most of the time that's not gonna change a lot, right? Once you get something in place, like uh, it's probably gonna be there for a while. And so we don't expect engineers to go and check this daily because that's not like a realistic expectation. So we leaned into uh, some alerting and some, some other notifications to help uh, engineers and leaders understand uh, what to do. Additionally, we built some kind of leadership views as well on top of this so that so uh, leaders have like a higher level view of, of what needs to happen. Thanks, Dave. 
The final use case that I'd like to address uses these two tools in conjunction for incident response. So take, for example, a hypothetical SSRF vulnerability that we find on some application. This could have come through an external report, say a bug bounty, or it could have been found internally. The first step that we would take is that we would query the data that we already have in asset inventory to identify our most at-risk applications in order to prioritize incident response. And in parallel, we'd look at what scanners can be built to help augment that data and understand our exposure to this vulnerability. So this is what the PRISM task that we would ultimately write over the course of this incident. We would actually write a checker for it as a PRISM task, deploy it and scan over our entire environment, actually exploiting our, uh, every single one of our applications to see which ones return the vulnerable response. When we find vulnerable services, it would, we would write that information back to asset inventory. We would then combine the data and use notification automation that Dave mentioned to let teams know what needs to be fixed. We continue testing to very verify not only that the issues had been fixed, but to make sure that there aren't any future regressions and the vulnerable component isn't reintroduced. And to that end, we leave the scanner running on a daily basis forever to verify that the issues don't come back. So once the vulnerability data is in asset inventory, we can triage our incident response process to focus first on our most at-risk applications. So in an example like this, we would query the GraphQL API to identify apps that are not just vulnerable, but also internet facing. In a real incident, there are many additional data points that we would consider. We would consider things like, does it have PII? Uh, what AWS account and what infrastructure does it communicate with? This allows us to return a list of vulnerable apps. And more importantly, this allows us to prioritize patching our riskiest assets first and helps reduce operational overhead as we start reaching out to developers. So we just gave a lot of information about these two tools and how they work together to effectively distribute security guidance. As this talk is about scaling application security, the question stands, how do we scale it? So asset inventory in summary collects application and relationship metadata and surfaces it in a queryable API. PRISM in turn calculates and writes security guidance to asset inventory. App owners then receive automated guidance, which adapts to the current state of their application. Between these two tools, we now have so many data points about all of our application that these have become vital for both incident response and running strategic security initiatives across our organization. Thank you, appreciate it. And now it's time for Q&A. Thank you so much, Dan and Dave. Um, we have a, again, whole bunch of questions that we won't be able to get to, but uh, we'll take it from the top. The most upvoted question by ATX is, how are risks introduced by first party app code or code interacting with third party services incorporated into this? Uh, I'll take this one. So it, we tend to take a very specialized, uh, a very tailored approach. We do have uh, third party vulnerability scanners that are running outside of PRISM. Uh, this isn't our only scanner. Uh, PRISM is much more for like very tailored campaigns, uh, very uh, specific to our Netflix infrastructure that we want to scan for and remediate across our organization. But generally speaking, if we find a vulnerability from a third party scanner or however it might come in, uh, generally we would make a JIRA ticket for it. And if we want to understand the scope of that act, uh, the scope of the impact of that vulnerability, not just across the vulnerable app that that scanner found, uh, we could then write a scanner for it via Prism or some other tool to, uh, to understand the scope of that exposure. And, and if I understand this question correctly, I think what they're, what they're saying is, so if we find a vulnerability in our code, then like, and that interacts with a third party service, like what do we do about that? Like, I, I don't know if like the, the thought is like, do we notify that third party service or like how do we understand those interactions maybe? And, and for that actually, we're, we're still kind of building that out more to understand like how our apps interact with like vendor and third party apps. Uh, that's, that's not something we have completely solved today. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next question, do you have a team specifically dedicated to maintaining the system or is it automated from end to end, not needing any human inter intervention at any point? And this question's from Ozioma. So the AppSec Eng team maintains a lot of uh, both of these services that we talked about today. Uh, for the most part, uh, I can speak for Prism. Dave, if you wanna take this uh, question for asset inventory. Uh, we obviously require manual intervention to build and run the task, but once it's running, it effectively executes in Spinnaker as a cron job. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned before, in cases of vulnerabilities, we'll just let this run indefinitely. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, software engineering, like there's gonna be some maintenance involved, but, uh, and that is our team that does that. But, uh, but yeah, for the most part, it's pretty solid and runs like, you know, almost all the time without any intervention and both both for asset inventory and prism, I would say. All right, thanks. And final question, uh, why use Postgres plus Gra GraphQL for asset inventory instead of using something like Neo4j? So, so we actually did uh, attempt to do this with Neo4j, actually, that was our first uh, in, like implementation of it. The problem that we found is, so one of our, one of our like core uh, requirements was that it could back web apps. And some, in Neo4j, we found it to be slow for running some queries that we needed it to run where with Postgres and uh, PostgreSQL was fast. And so that, that's, that's why that turned out. But, but there are then things that we can't really do with, you know, we can't do graph, like real graph queries where you say, you know, here's an app and here's an app, how do these relate? And so like there, there's probably like uh, really room for both types of things. And, and like, we're still investigating that. And we, you know, we may, we may augment what we have with additional things. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan and Dave. I think we're at time. There are more questions, so take a look at those. Um, and we'll, if, if there's time to discuss those things in breakouts, we'll uh, make sure to prioritize that. So now we're gonna break out into our birds of a feather sessions. We have four topics with some amazing facilitators for each of them. At the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a little box that says breakout rooms. It's just popped up and says join a breakout room. Um, please click on that and head to your breakout room. You can self select into those things and then come back and choose a different breakout room if, if you decide you wanna uh, participate in a different discussion. So our topics are automating AppSec, security assessments at scale, people and security, and bug bounty and product security incident response at scale. So please go ahead and head in that direction. All right, we are at the end of our event. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It was amazing to hear from so many folks to talk about the issues that we faced scaling security and the challenges and, and how we're approaching those things. I hope you all got a chance to learn something new, to connect with each other, to chat about some of the uh, problems that you're solving together. I wanted to give um, a special thanks to uh, the Netflix talent and events team. They have helped run this whole entire thing and helped uh, keep us all on track with more detail than I possibly could have like thought of ahead of time. Um, so thank you so much, truly. Uh, Antonia, Spencer, Will, Chelsea for all of your help with that. And um, the organizers, uh, these folks helped make this thing possible. So Jiva and Lakshmi, Ken, Jill, and Vlad participated in, in uh, lots of planning meetings. Um, and then our speakers in order of appearance, Phil, Ariel, Vlad, Dave, and Dan, thank you so, so, so much. This was fantastic. Um, and I do wanna do a quick plug. I think all of the, uh, all the, um, Companies who participated in this thing we're hiring. So if these are interesting, thought-provoking problems for you, please reach out. Um, would love to hear how everybody loved this. So if you have feedback to share, um, please also reach out. And thank you so much. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Bye.